means that getting a Nobel Prize doesn't guarantee that you will be listened to. So, biology beyond the genome, and for those of you who are book addicts, the Music of Life is the first one that actually used the subtitle Biology Beyond the Genome, and you'll understand that when I talk about the talk today. And there is a forthcoming book due out next month from Cambridge University Press, um, Understanding Living Systems. So, because you're a very general audience, I'm going to say a word or two about what is um, the genome. And it is, of course, a very long, thin thread in all the trillions of your cells. It's a thread of molecules called nucleotides because they're molecules that sit in the nucleus. Most of them, anyway. There happen to be just four types. A, T, G, and C. That's all you need to know. In you and me, the genome contains three billion of those in every single one of your cells except for our red blood cells. Now, important point, they are chemicals. And those of you who know your chemistry will know that chemicals can only do what chemicals can do. They do what chemicals automatically do. And they like to bind together in pairs. A likes to be with T and G with C. Those are chemical attractions dependent upon the energies in those molecules. And in doing this, they have no choice. They cannot therefore be described as selfish, either metaphorically or literally. Only organisms, you, me, and the cat, and the bacterium, only they can be described as selfish or cooperative. And in case you're wondering, we're not born selfish either. A baby cannot be born selfish. It simply has needs, food and care to enable it to live, grow and flourish. And it slowly learns that it can choose. Now, a bit of size comparison. If I enlarged a nucleotide from one of our genomes to the size of my fist, the size of a golf ball, the living cell would be the size of the United Kingdom. And if the nucleus were here in hay, and here's the nucleotide, the edge of the cell would be way up there in Scotland. You'll see the significance of this very soon. And part of what I want to get across to you today is that focusing on genome sequencing, you can all go and buy your genome from 23andMe, I'm not supposed to do adverts, that's okay. Anyway, focusing on genome sequencing is a little bit like mistaking the pixels for the message. I've put here, we wish them all well, because that's the ending of my new book coming out next month, um, Understanding Living Systems. And if we looked at that message, and expanded it up just a little bit, nowhere near the degree to which we'd have to represent the difference between a nucleotide and the edge of the cell up in Scotland. All we can see are pixels. We no longer understand um, the message. At sufficient magnification, therefore, the meaning is no longer evident. And that is true for you and me and all organisms that have to read their genomes in order to make proteins. We don't understand what the C, G, A, and T mean. We don't need to, either. So, how did the genome become described around the year 1980, so over 40 years ago now, as the Book of Life? Creating us body and mind, of course, if you want to follow Richard. And if that was so, there's a very simple test. The conditional logic of life would have to be found in the genome. 
Now, I write computer programs. That's how I worked out just 63 years ago how your pacemaker mechanism works in the heart. I wrote a computer program to represent that on an old valve computer. I know what computer programs have got to have in them. They've got to have the conditional clauses, the if, then, else clauses. And if you look for those in the genome, you will not find them anywhere in the genome. The genome has switches. Every gene, every part of the sequence that needs to be read to make proteins or RNAs, those have switches. But the control of those switches is elsewhere. It's not in the genome itself. And I want here to recommend an article which came out in a journal that I edit, Progress in Biophysics, just a couple of years ago by Keith Baverstock. He wrote an article, The Gene and Appraisal. You can find it on the internet without too much difficulty. He wrote, the gene plays a passive role as a vital information store. It enables us to make all the proteins we need, all the RNAs we need. But it is the phenotype, that is you and me, that plays the active role. So where are life's control routines? I'm a cellular electrophysiologist in origin. And I can tell you where they are because that's where the if-then-else clauses are. That's where the code if you want to call it that, are lies that enable us to make choices. Those are our conditional on-off switches. They're in the membranes of our cells and their protein channels. Without those membrane processes, there could not be choice in response to electrical and chemical signals. And choice is an essential element of any theory on what it is to be selfish or cooperative. Moreover, all our nerve cells have those on-off switches, the channels that enable it to be possible. And furthermore, there are no genes for any of those membranes. All the lipids that form the membranes and the complicated structures that you can see in a typical cell, none of that is coded for in the genome. All of that is inherited. Now, go back to the genome. Each triplet, that is three nucleotides, corresponds in the translation mechanism in your cells and mine to an amino acid in a protein. For example, AGC enables the amino acid serine to be selected. Don't worry if you don't know what serine is. It doesn't matter too much. Now, this is what is often called the genetic code. But as Baverstock's article makes crystal clear, it's not a code, it's a template. It's simply something that enables something else to be made. As I said earlier on, there is simply no code of life or program of life in the genome. And so I'm now going to unravel the four major common misunderstandings that have infected our understanding of what it is to be a living system, which is what the new book coming out by Cambridge next month is about. There are four. The first is the central dogma of molecular biology, which is the idea that there's simply one way of causation, all the way from those gene sequences to the proteins to the body, and therefore to you and me, and which then determine whether we are selfish or cooperative. The second is the Weissmann barrier. That's the idea that the future eggs and sperm are not influenced by what we learn as organisms during our lifetime. That's the idea there's a complete separation of the germline away from the body as a whole. The third one is that DNA just replicates itself. It does so like a crystal. And the fourth is therefore the idea that the replicator and the vehicle, that's the cells in your and my body, are completely separate. And that's, of course, the central idea of the selfish gene. I'm just going to go briefly through each of those. First of all, the central dogma. Francis Crick formulated this in 1958, and then he reformulated it in 1970. We don't need to go into the detail of that. What you need to know is that it's real 
when it is taken to refer to a simple chemical fact that DNA sequences are used by living cells to make amino acid sequences forming proteins. But it is illusory and completely misleading when taken to exclude control of the genome and its reorganization by living systems. Now, the evidence that reorganization of genomes has occurred during evolution, during the evolution of us too, was one of the major discoveries of the first sequencing of the human genome in the year 2001. It is in the Nature paper when the first human genome sequence was announced to grand fanfares over in Washington and over here in London. Now, the point about that is that very few people seem to know that what figure 42 in that article in Nature in 2001 shows is that in the evolution of some of the key proteins in our bodies, as you go through the various species from a bacterium through to yeast through to more complex organisms like a mouse through to us as humans they have formed themselves by accretion of chunks of protein to form proteins with more and more functionality that means of course that the organisms as they developed and as they evolved must have known how it was possible to move this chunk of DNA over there to put it in connection with that bit over here and so on and so forth. If you calculate the probability that that could happen by chance it would not just take the 13 billion years of the universe it would take even more than that it's extremely improbable that that could have occurred by chance. So, the first point I make is that there is clear and hard evidence that it must be the case that organisms are capable of reorganizing their genomes in response to stress. Moreover, that's an old discovery. It was found by Barbara McClintock working on corn, the plant, way back in the 1940s, published in genetics during the 1950s, eventually given the Nobel Prize in 1983, and then she was completely ignored. Means that getting a Nobel Prize doesn't guarantee that you will be listened to. That's another problem. Okay, that's the central dogma, finished. There is no central dogma. The Weissmann barrier, that's the it's named after August Weissmann, the German geneticist who introduced the idea. He introduced it primarily to exclude from Charles Darwin's ideas the idea that the body could communicate to the future egg and sperm. So it was introduced precisely to remove an important aspect of evolution that Darwin himself favored. Now, today, his idea how this could happen. He speculated, you see, somehow if my body changes it must be possible that information gets transmitted to the sperm and egg cells. So he said there must be tiny particles that cells give off. Well he knew that was the case because even in the 19th century people knew that little particles were pushed off by cells. He called them gemules. We found them. They're today called extracellular vesicles or exosomes. What do they do? They carry RNAs that control the genome for its metabolic activities and so on to the germline. That has been demonstrated. Now, the Weissmann barrier, therefore, there never was any good evidence for it, incidentally, and I'm happy in question time if you want me to justify that statement. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.